We're on the home stretch here. Um, so uh, now that I've described BECs uh, and some of the nice properties, like superfluid properties of BECs, let me talk about two applications of those Einstein condensates, uh, atom optics and condensed matter atoms. So uh, most of you are familiar with the idea of particle wave duality. Uh, this is the light. Behave like a particle or a wave, it's something matter, and so there's this duality between the two. Um, as a result, you can actually uh, imagine uh, that there would be a field called atom optics, which is the manipulation of atoms analogous to the manipulation of light. So if you have uh, uh, light, uh, you can manipulate uh, using beam splitters and mirrors and so on, uh, basically exploiting the wave nature of the uh, of the light. You can do the same thing with atoms because they also uh, behave like waves um, characterized by the Broglie wavelength. And this field started shortly after uh, the development of uh, laser cooled atoms. Um, well, actually, there were experiments prior to that, actually. Uh, but um, the field really started taking off after laser cooled atoms. And then with the arrival of Bose Einstein condensates, I, the field really took off because now you actually have a source of atoms, atoms analogous to the source of photons from a laser. So even though laser-cooled atoms are quite cold, it's still a thermal source, so it's sort of like working with a light bulb with a filter in front of it where you sort of narrow up the uh, spectrum coming out. But with the BEC, you actually have a source, um, a source of a macroscopic wave analogous to a laser, and I'll describe a little bit what I mean by that. As a result, you can do experiments on, in atom optics, uh, which uh, people often refer to as linear atom optics, basically designing lenses, mirrors, beam splitters, and so on, as uh, devices for manipulating atomic beams. And examples of these include diffraction radius and neutrometers, and so on. It turns out that you can also do experiments that are analogous to nonlinear optics in, in using matter waves or atoms. And this is because the atoms interact, and I'll describe a couple of experiments in this area. So the analogy between uh, atom laser and an optical laser. Um, uh, for an optical laser, you have uh, one of the things you need is some sort of uh, cavity. Um, and so you have two mirrors in the system, which provide an optical cavity. For the atom laser, uh, typically your cavity is your trap. Um, in this case, it would be like a harmonic trap. You need some sort of gain medium in the system. Um, and so you have some system that you pump externally in an optical cavity uh, as your gain medium. For the atom laser, it's typically your gain medium is your thermal atoms in the process of evaporative cooling is the, the pumping process. The evaporative cooling allows atoms to be stimulated into the, into the, into the wave, the macroscopic matter wave, uh, analogous to the photons being stimulated into the cavity from the gain medium. And of course, if you want something useful coming out of your laser, you need some way to get the beam out, and so you have a, typically have an output coupler. Same thing in an atom laser, you need some way to couple out the atoms from your trap. And so a lot of initial research in uh, uh, atom laser development and Bose-Einstein condensate were involved in developing different types of output couplers, because in some sense, once you get your Bose-Einstein condensate, uh, you've gotten the rest of the elements uh, for free, essentially. And so you need some way to couple the atoms out. And there were a number of uh, techniques developed. Um, the earliest technique developed was basically to take your atoms which are sitting in your magnetic trap, uh, your Bose-Einstein condensate, and transfer them to a state where they don't feel the magnetic uh, trap anymore. So if they're in a, a, a magnetic sublevel that's trapped, you can transfer them to a magnetic sublevel that doesn't feel any trapping force. And as a result, the atoms are no longer uh, held in the trap, and typically they fall out under the influence of gravity, so they get coupled to an untrapped state and just fall out of the trap. And so the first demonstration of this was done in, in 1997 in Wolfgang Ketterle's group at MIT, where he used pulses of radio frequency to couple atoms out. And an improvement of that uh, came in 1999 in uh, uh, Hench's group in Munich, where they actually <laughs> could apply the radio frequency continuously and get a continuous beam coming out. Um, in NIST, we did research where we actually, instead of using radio frequency, we used two-photon Raman transitions to take the atoms from the trap state to an untrapped state. 
the advantage of this is that uh, one is that you can the direction of your beam coming out doesn't depend on gravity. Uh, it doesn't have to fall out of the trap. It, because you're transferring momentum to the atoms from this two-photon process, you can actually kick the atoms off in some direction. So we can demonstrate that we generated a beam propagating perpendicular to gravity. It also has some other advantages in the sense that you're getting atoms out of the condensate faster, and so you don't have to worry about uh, dispersion as much or spreading the beam. And then there was an experiment about the same time out of Mark Tasevich's group where he trapped the Rose Einstein condensate in a one-dimensional optical lattice. So in some sense, you had a bunch of little condensates in these potential wells. And the atoms would tunnel out of the potential well in the presence of gravity. And so because of each of these wells was space coherent with the next, he saw pulses coming out of analogous to a Moldock laser. But these were matter waves. And so, uh, uh, the time period for a lot of that research was around 2000, and so here's a picture of the MIT cloud coming out, so the continuous beam from Munich, the, the analogous to uh, the, you know, the laser that's analogous to a Mozart laser in Yale, and our group demonstrated the Raman alpha coupler, uh, which is propagating perpendicular to gravity. Uh, there are actually a lot more atom lasers now. I didn't want to put all of them up. Um, and research in this area has shifted from <coughs> alpha couplers, which people are pretty uh, uh, proficient in develop or implementing now, to measuring, for example, the properties of the beams coming out. There's a, a large research program in Hench's group in Munich looking at the correlation functions of the beam coming out. One of the defining uh, characteristics of a laser beam compared to a thermal source are the, the correlations of the photons coming out. And so we measure both the first order a correlation function and the second order correlation function, um, and so on. Uh, people are also uh, have gone past the stage of developing atom lasers to applying them in various applications, including building atom interferometers. But one of the things, the challenges that still remains is to develop a truly continuous beam of atoms. If you look at these pictures, uh, I can couple atoms out into a beam, uh, but I'm basically limited in the amount of atoms I can couple out by the number of atoms I started with in the trap. Really what you want is a process where you, you can, analogous to the laser, where you're continually pumping the system, and even though you're coupling atoms out, you're continually building, uh, replenishing the, the, the photons in this cavity, as opposed to the BEC experiments, where after you couple all the atoms out of the BEC, you have to basically start the whole process all over again. So there's been a few breakthroughs in that, but there's still awaiting, a, for example, at, at Australian National University, they've developed uh, a scheme for, uh, for replenishing the beam, uh, which to some extent uh, allows you some degree of co uh, continuous operation, but it's still uh, limited by uh, the source, the size of the source that you're working with. Right? So uh, research still continues in this direction, and it's quite challenging, a number of groups are involved in it. Um, here's a uh, an example of a nonlinear, I mean, sorry, a linear op atom optical element uh, diffraction. Um, in this case, uh, it's diffraction of a Bose-Einstein condensate. So normally, I, my BEC would be in a zero momentum state. What you can do is you can apply a pulsed optical standing wave to the BEC, and what this does is it allows the BEC to diffract. So it's analogous to taking a beam of light and putting a phase gradient in front of the, the beam of light. And when the light passes through the phase gradient, it diffracts out into various diffraction orders. Microscopically, what's happening is you're redistributing photons in this optical standing wave. You're absorbing from one beam and stimulating it into another. And so you find that the, uh, the momentum you transfer from this optical standing wave are in units of 2H bar K, which happens uh, but another way to think of this is you basically are applying a phase gradient with a periodicity of lambda over 2. As a result, the, uh, the momentum uh, spread that you're going to see in the refractive uh, signal is going to be uh, separated by 2H bar K. So if you apply a short pulse, you can put uh, most of the population, uh, refractive population, in, for example, a plus and minus first orders. Uh, longer pulses can apply uh, diffractions uh, put atoms in the higher order diffraction uh, orders. Um, 
one way to uh, think of this is that, uh, as I mentioned, it's acting as a free phase free. Uh, exactly why do the atoms get a phase uh, shift when they go through? It's basically due to the AC start shift. So it's the same force that's responsible, uh, the same interaction that's responsible for the optical dipole force allows you to imprint, if you like, a phase onto the matter wave. So what I do is you start with your BEC and you apply the sinusoidally varying intensity. As a result, the, um, the, the energy shift is going to vary in space uh, sinusoidally. And if you do this for a short pulse, so that the atoms basically have not moved, if you apply a long pulse, then you expect the atoms to rattle around in this optical potential. But you apply it for a short pulse, so basically you're just imprinting the phase on the cloud. And then the cloud will evolve after some time. So here's an example. If I have the intensity goes like a, uh, for a standing rate, it goes like sine of twice the k vector. Um, and this intensity will result in an energy shift on the atoms. And you can imprint that phase shift onto your cloud. So basically you're taking the initial VEC wave function, and I'm writing a phase pattern on it. And the phase pattern goes like the energy shift times the amount of time that I apply this pulse. And because I have a sinusoidally varying intensity pattern, uh, this phase that you write is also going to vary in space sinusoidally. So now the resulting wave function after I imprint this phase on it uh, has this uh, uh, phase factor up here. And you can uh, decompose this into a different set of uh, Momentum. If you look at this, it's basically what results is uh, you projected it into different momentum states. So you projected this wave function. You can expand this out in terms of vessel functions, and what you find is that you've uh, taken this uh, wave function and you've populated momentum states that differ by plus uh, integer multiples of 2h bar k with the population given by the vessel functions. So as I mentioned, what you've done is you've taken photons from one beam and put them into the counter-propagating medium. As a result, all your processes transfer to H bar K. So this is a very easy way to do to transfer momentum to the atoms. And so you can imagine uh, this is one way to either build a beam splitter, because you have, and the process is fully coherent, so I, I have a beam splitter. I have atoms in two different momentum states, in a superposition of two different momentum states. Um, and it's also another way to do a mirror. So you can imagine building an atom interferometer or an interferometer based on this diffraction rate. Uh, a technique that's probably a little bit better to use is something that's analogous to Bragg diffraction. So uh, Bragg diffraction, uh, as you may have learned, is when you have a, a, a periodic array of scatters, for example, if I have ions in a crystal, and I send x-rays in, uh, the x-rays will scatter off the ions. But if I come in at just the right angle, what will happen is the scattered uh, like from uh, the scattered x-rays from these ions will all add up coherently in one direction. And you get a peak in the scattering for a certain incident angle. And this is called Bragg scattering. You can do the analogous thing with atoms uh, and light, where instead of having a, an array of scatters, like uh, a periodic array of scatters, what I have is a periodic potential that the atoms can scatter. So I have an optical standing wave which acts as a periodic potential you can imagine if I had a beam of atoms coming down, they would scatter off of this periodic potential. And for some incident angle, the scattering off of each one of these nodes or antinodes of the potential, depending on the sign of the infinity, would add up coherently in some direction and give you a, a, a peak in the scattering. And this is analogous to Bragg scattering. Um, in practice, your BEC is at rest, so you don't actually come in at some incident uh, momentum incident angle, your BEC is at rest. So instead what you do is you move the standing wave with respect to the atoms so that it, from the reference frame of the standing wave, it looks like the atoms are coming in at with some net velocity or net momentum. The way you actually implement this is you use uh, a pair of laser beams uh, and you have a relative detuning between the two laser beams so you create this uh, standing wave that's moving because of the relative detuning. Um, and so what this allows you to do is uh, create the moving standing wave that you scatter off of. If you want to know what's happening from, uh, you can use this uh, Raman picture here. Basically what you're doing is you're taking atoms are absorbing a photon from one beam, 
let's say the one at the, the higher frequency, omega plus delta, and they're being stimulated to emit photons into the lower energy beam. And this process will be resonant, so you'll satisfy the Bragg scattering condition uh, when you satisfy energy conservation. So if I start with my atoms initially at rest, and I transfer 2H, let's say I take two counter-propagating laser beams and I transfer 2H bar K of momentum to the atoms, then the atoms are now moving with 2H bar K of momentum, so they'll have a net kinetic energy. And so to make this process resonant, you want the energy difference between the two laser beams to be equal to the net gain in kinetic energy from this process. And you can do that uh, in the case of sodium atoms that I'm working with here, that energy difference, uh, that frequency difference between the two beams has to be 100 kilohertz, so that, that's easy to do. So here's some images of the Bose-Einstein condensate initially at rest. I apply two counter-propagating laser beams with a relative detuning so that they'll undergo Bragg diffraction or, uh, if you like, this two-photon Raman process. So they've absorbed the photon from one beam coming this way and they've stimulated to emit a photon to the counter-propagating beam and as a result get another recoil, uh, another recoil kick of uh, photon momentum. And so after this two-photon Raman process, the atoms have a net momentum and they're moving off in this direction. And so if I wait some time and take a picture of the atoms, they, can, they move to a new location right here. Uh, this process is fully coherent. You can transfer, and it's highly efficient, you can transfer 100% of the atoms, if you like, to the moving state. In this case, we left a little bit of the atoms in the initial state, so you can see where they started from. And you can even uh, transfer them back, or you can put them in a superposition of two different momentum states by applying this equivalent to a pi over two plus. If you like, in sort of atomic physics language, what you're doing is you're basically uh, undergoing Rabi oscillations between uh, two different momentum states here, in this case, zero and two H bar K. But it's a very nice technique because one, unlike the normal diffraction, um, where you ended up with, uh, in this case, you're, you put the atoms in three different momentum states and for, for uh, more intense or longer pulses, you can go sort of in, put them in higher order diffraction. Here you can limit, with Bragg diffraction, you can limit things to just two different momentum states. And so, in some sense, it's a much more efficient way to, to make a beam splitter. If I put the atoms in a coherent superposition of two different momentum states, it acts as a beam splitter. If I've transferred all the atoms to a different momentum state, in some sense, it's acted as a mirror. So I've changed the, the momentum of the, the matter wave. Uh, you can extend this to higher order processes. You can, instead of doing two photon, you can go to four photon, uh, transfer four H bar K of momentum, in this case, uh, six photon, transfer uh, six to H bar K of momentum and so on. And just by flipping the relative uh, frequency between the laser, you can actually pick the atoms the other way and so on. So it's, uh, it's a very convenient technique that we've developed for manipulating Bose-Einstein condensates, changing the center of mass momentum of the Bose-Einstein condensate, in addition to putting the atoms in a superposition of different momentum states. And so now, uh, one thing we did is we combined, uh, we used this technique to build an atom interferometer so I have, here's my optical standing wave under where I've set it up to do Bragg diffraction. And what I, in this case, I, if you apply a pulse, uh, what's equivalent to a pi over two pulse, I can put the, the BEC in a superposition of the initial zero momentum state and a state with two H bar K of momentum moving along the direction of this standing, standing wave. And so the atoms in these two different momentum states will separate and at some time later, what I can do is apply what's equivalent to a pi pulse. So I take the atoms in the, in the 2 h bar k momentum state and transfer them back to the zero momentum state. And I take the atoms in the zero momentum state and transfer them to the 2 h bar k state. So the second pulse acts like a mirror in your interferometer. The first pulse was your beam splitter. This one acts like a mirror. It changed the momentum, relative momentum between the two atom clouds, so they start moving back towards each other. And when they're overlapped again, you can apply another pi over two pulse to couple these two momentum states together. So this acts like the final beam split of the interferometer. So this is very uh, reminiscent of a Mach sender interferometer. And what you get on the output of this beam splitter, if you like, this atom beam splitter, is you get two outputs corresponding to the two outputs of a normal interferometer. And the, the number of atoms you get in the, the two outputs depends on the relative phase between the two paths. So you can, um, you can vary the relative phase between the two paths so you get uh, different numbers of atoms coming out 
You can even write phase patterns onto the cloud and get uh, spatially varying patterns coming up of your nephrometer. So we've, demo we've spent a lot of time demonstrating and developing a lot of techniques to manipulate atoms that are in the realm of linear atom optics. We've built atom nephrometers and used them for various, uh, various tests and showed that they work. Um, one of the interesting things that we, we embarked on when in atom optics was the development of nonlinear atom optics. So as I mentioned, um, matter waves interact with each other. If you remember the, the description of the Bose-Einstein condensate, it was by this nonlinear short here equation that had a term that, due to the interaction of the atoms. As a result, you'd expect the matter waves to exhibit effects that are analogous to nonlinear optics the optical effects where the photons interact via some sort of nonlinear medium like a crystal. And two such uh, effects are four way mixing. So if I have three light beams and I send them into a nonlinear crystal, it's possible to get a fourth light beam coming out, which depends on either the sum or differences of the frequencies of the input beam. Also, if I have a light pulse that I send in to a nonlinear crystal, it's possible to generate a soliton so that the pulse propagates without spreading while it's in the crystal. So these ideas were uh, put forward to us by a couple of our theoretical colleagues at NIST at the time. Uh, in fact, the first experiment we did in nonlinear atom optics involved four-way mixing of matter waves. And it suggested that if you had three different Bose-Einstein condensates with three different momenta, and if I collided them together with the right momenta, then what would happen is you would generate a fourth momentum coming out, which depends on the sum and difference of uh, the three input momenta. And the reason for this is because, as I mentioned, the description of the Bose-Einstein condensate is this nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which has this nonlinear term. And that couples the three different momentum states together because of this psi q term. It's analogous to a chi 3 term in a, in a nonlinear crystal for coupling three electromagnetic waves. So we did the experiment. We put the atoms in a superposition of three different momentum states using this Bragg diffraction technique. And what we saw, these were the three different initial momentum states. And what we saw when we did that just right, so that we satisfied both energy and momentum conservation, which is equivalent to phase matching for an optical uh, system, is that we saw a fourth matter wave coming out with the right momentum state. So here's, uh, this is actually a prediction of what we should get in the period. In the uh, from the theoretical calculation based on the gross Kidievsky equation. And here's actually what we observed in the experiment. We saw this fourth matter wave keep coming out. So this was the first demonstration of nonlinear optics with matter waves. Uh, as I mentioned, you, uh, another thing that might be interesting to look at is solitons, and we actually uh, generated solitons in the BEC. Um, it was suggested by also by uh, colleagues at NIST at the time that if you took two different matter waves, or DCs, and you couple them, allow them to collide with each other, because of the interaction between the atoms, you would get uh, the generation of soliton. If the interactions between the atoms were attractive, you'd generate a bright soliton. If the interactions were repulsive, you'd actually generate a dark soliton, which corresponds to a density notch. In our case, the type of DCs we were working with have repulsive interactions, so we expected to generate a dark soliton. And one of the characteristics of a dark soliton is that there's a, a phase step going across the soliton equal to pi, if it's a perfectly dark soliton. If it's not a perfectly dark soliton, then the phase step is going to be something less than pi. And so we actually, in order to generate the soliton, what we did is we actually wrote a phase step onto our BEC using this phase imprinting technique that I described for putting, uh, uh, for diffracting atoms. And so what you can do is you can illuminate half the BEC with light so that half the BEC gets a phase shift due to the AC start shift, and the other half of the BEC doesn't. And if you choose the intensity and the pulse duration just right, you can write a phase step of pi across the BEC. And what you see after that is you see the, the generation of a soliton in our bose kind of concept. So here's some of the first experiments we did on generation of solitons. We also looked at propagation of the soliton. If you don't write exactly, if you have a perfect phase step of pi across your soliton, 
It should be perfectly dark. The density should go to zero in the middle. And the soliton should be stationary. But if you don't have exactly a pi phase step across it, the density doesn't go all the way to zero, and the soliton starts moving. But the speed at which it moves, it moves at less than the speed of sound, and the amount less than the speed of sound is determined by the amount of phase shift across it. And so we can actually generate a soliton and watch it propagate through the cloud, and it seems to agree with calculations based on the speed of the equation. Uh, about the same time, solitons were also observed in the group in Hanover, in Wolfgang Ermer's group. And since then, these initial experiments, there's been a number of experiments on looking at solitons and BECs. Uh, people have generated using optical lattices, they've generated gap solitons, and, and all sorts of other solitons, looked at soliton collisions, and so on. And so soliton generation in bose einstein condensate is still a very popular subject. Um, and there's still a number of groups looking at that. So the other thing I wanted to mention in the, in the remaining few minutes is uh, condensed matter analogs, or going beyond uh, the mean field regime. So here's a, a, a diagram which uh, came from Emmanuel Bloch, who's in Munich. Uh, most of the experiments I described so far were for the weakly interacting dilute Bose gas. And so you can see generation of vortices, uh, see the effects of nonlinear atom optics, look at coherence effects like atom laser type experiments, superfluid flow, and so on. What might be interesting is somehow getting to a regime where the atoms are much more strongly interacting. So, um, and look what happens to the, the wave function as you cross over into the strongly interacting regime. A number, for a number of predictions, you would see a strong correlation between the particles. If you get the lower dimension, you can see, uh, like in one dimension, you can see something called the Tonks gas. Uh, predictions of a, a, uh, a transition, a, a superfluid insulator transition, and so on. And so the question is, how do you actually go from this weakly interacting system to a strongly interacting or strongly correlated system. And there's essentially two different strategies to do this. Um, one is to use something called Feshbach resonances, which uh, basically there's a way to actually tune a scattering resonance. So normally when two atoms scatter, they, have, well, they follow some sort of scattering potential. The two atoms come in, they scatter off of each other, and they go back out. It's possible to actually somehow uh, make the process resonant with a different state. So in this case, you have one scattering channel the atoms are coming in on. There's another uh, channel that if the atoms were in a different state, they would come in and scatter off of. But um, using magnetic fields or even optical fields, you can actually shift this energy levels of this other state so that they come into resonance with the two atoms scattering. And if you like, in this in sort of uh, uh, almost classical picture, you can imagine the atoms coming in, they somehow end up coupling to this other state and rattle around and then come back out. As a result, their scattering properties have changed. And if you go through the calculation, you find that effectively what happens is that the scattering length changes in the system, the S-wave scattering length. And in the case, for example, if you use a magnetic field to bring another set of states into resonance with the scattering, you find that this, you can actually uh, change the scattering length. So it, um, quite a bit, and it makes this sort of dispersion relation. So you have the, the scattering length in the absence of uh, any coupling to this other state. But then as you hit, bring this other state into resonance, the scattering will actually, um, the scattering length will increase substantially. And so people have used this technique to actually change the scattering length of the system quite a bit. So you can go from a system that's weakly interacting to strongly interacting this uh, this way. Um, this was first demonstrated in the Bose Einstein condensate in the Wolfgang Federley's group in 1998. Um, the problem is, a lot of times, though, what happens when you tune over one of these uh, Feshbach resonances is you have a lot of loss in the system, uh, either three body losses or other loss mechanisms, which tend to limit how far up this curve you can go to change the scattering length. So there's actually another strategy for changing the scattering length. It was shown here on the uh, on this diagram, and that's to actually confine the atoms tighter. And one way to do this is to use um, 
One way to do this is to use uh, an optical lattice. And let it stop. <laughs> There's nothing up there that should stop it. Oh, there we go. So one way to do this is to use an optical <coughs> lattice. So as I mentioned at the end of the uh, talk on laser cooling, you can actually confine atoms in optical standing waves. Uh, and, and this is called an optical lattice. It's a periodic uh, potential for the atoms. But what happens when you combine the atoms in the optical lattice is that if I have more than one atom and they're both combined in the, in the optical lattice, then there's, a, there's going to be an interaction between the two. And if the confinement's tight enough, because the, the interaction basically goes like the density, uh, you find that the interactions here can be really strong if you, if you combine the cloud to, or if you combine the atoms to a very small volume. So by increasing the depth of this optical potential, you can get the atoms to sort of squish up at the bottom and get a very strong interaction. So, um, there's a number of ways you can do this. Uh, so if you start with your initial cloud, you can actually put the atoms, if you like, uh, in tubes. Uh, and you can see start seeing effects of stronger interactions this way by applying basically two optical lattices. But typically, people use three pairs of standing waves to combine the atoms in a, in a three-dimensional structure. Because now you're, you're working in a regime uh, where the atoms are much more strongly interacting and strongly correlated, you can't use the simple Gross-Pudievsky equation uh, describing uh, the interaction by the mean field anymore. Uh, the appropriate description, or the one that seems to work best for optical lattices, is this so-called Bose-Hubbard model, where you have a term which describes the hopping from one lattice site to the other lattice site, and you have a term which describes the interactions of atoms in a particular lattice site, uh, parameterized here by this index i. Um, and then there's also a term uh, off, which you can stick in, which describes sort of the variation of the height or energy of a lattice site due to the curvature of the overall trapping potential here. Now the tunneling matrix, uh, you can just compute uh, uh, by knowing what the wave function looks like in these wells. And typically the wave function inside one of these lattice sites is, is a localized wave function uh, determined by, by the sort of the Vanier states of the system. Uh, you can also calculate what the on-site interaction is, and it's again because of the, uh, the scattering, it's determined by S-wave scattering, so it just depends on this S-wave scattering parameter here. And so this type of interaction was used to describe uh, uh, atoms hopping from one site uh, well to an, uh, another well uh, by Fisher, and he also predicted uh, an interesting phase transition. And more recently, or subsequently, it was actually applied to uh, atoms, like for example, Bose Einstein condensate in this paper from Peter Zoller's view. So there are basically two limits that you can study in this, uh, or there are two limits to this uh, Bose Hubbard model. One is the superfluid limit, where basically you have a lot of tunneling or hopping of atoms from one site to the other. And in this case, the atoms are going to be delocalized over this entire lattice. And so it's, it's you have a, a wave function that's sort of analogous to the DEC wave function. And if you look, you're going to find that the number of atoms, if you look at any well, you're going to find a fluctuation in the number of atoms, because the atoms are hopping from one well to another well. And the amount of atoms in any particular well is going to be described by a Poisson distribution. On the other hand, you can go to the other regime where you have the interactions between the atoms are very strong. And what this does is it means that because the interactions are strong, it suppresses the atoms from wanting to be in one well, from more than one atom to be in one well. Because if I hop over here, it costs a lot of energy for me to sit on top of this other atom. So as a result, what it does is it tries to force the atoms to be distributed evenly uh, in, in any uh, particular well, the number of atoms to be evenly distributed. In fact, ideally, you want one atom per well so that there's no interaction between the atoms. And so the atoms now become localized to the, to the lattice site. So the fluctuations in the number of atoms in a particular site has gone way down to near zero. And so you find that the average number of atoms in the site is now equal to one with essentially no, no fluctuations. 
The way you can detect this, uh, whether you're in the uh, superfluid or the insulator regime, is to use atom interferometry. You can release the atoms from the lattice and look at the resulting interference pattern. So in the superfluid limit, I have the same diffraction pattern that I observed before. If you can imagine this is a DC, and I'm applying atoms are in this uh, in this periodic potential. And there's a well-defined phase relationship between uh, atoms in one potential and atoms in the next potential. So when you release the atoms, you get a diffraction pattern that reflects what the, the resulting uh, momentum distribution is from the interfering uh, matter waves. And you can see this in, in this example for one dimension, but you can also look at it in higher order dimensions when you see these diffraction peaks in the various directions uh, corresponding to the, the uh, inverse wave vectors of this lattice structure. On the other hand, if you go to the other regime, the Mott insulator regime, where you have the interactions much stronger than the tunnel insulator, if you localize the atoms, uh, for example, one per site, then there's no well-defined phase in going from one well to the next well between the atoms. And so when I release them and they interfere, all these uh, atoms interfere, you find that you have no net, no nice diffraction signal. It sort of just washes out. And so it's easy to tell which regime you're in, basically by looking at the diffraction pattern. And so this was used to actually probe what's called the Mott insulator transition with ultracold atoms. As I mentioned, this, the Mott insulator transition was predicted based on this uh, Bose Hubbard model by Fisher and colleagues back in 1989. And then in 1988, uh, in Peter Zoller's group, they, uh, they did the calculation for ultracold atoms in an optical lattice. But uh, the real breakthrough came in 2002 with the experiment out of uh, Hench's group where they actually did this by taking the Bose-Einstein condensate and putting it into a three-dimensional optical lattice. And so here's some uh, results from the data. They Initially what they did is they started with their Bose-Einstein condensate. They turned up the three-dimensional optical lattice and held it at some depth, lattice depth, for some time, and then ramped it down to some value and shut it off and looked to see whether the atoms are diffracted or not. And so here's a series of images of the diffraction signal as a function of the height of this lattice step. And what you see is that for any uh, reasonable lattice step, you see diffraction signals. But eventually, if you go to a high enough lattice step, the diffraction signal starts washing out. And what you've done is you've started, instead of having the atoms in this sort of superfluid phase, you've localized these atoms here into this. You've crossed over into this insulator transition and you've localized atoms into the, the site. And so this is sort of a pioneering experiment because it, it, one, it, it allowed you to take atoms into this strongly interacting regime, these Bose-Einstein condensates, into the strongly interacting regime and see a, a, essentially a quantum phase transition in this regime. So since then, uh, a lot of emphasis on ultra-cold atoms and lattices has been directed toward looking at many body effects. And so ultra-cold atoms are now sort of firmly entrenched in the world of condensed matter or solid-state physics as, as sort of analogs in which to study phenomena that occurs in solid-state or condensed matter physics. Uh, it's a very active area of research. Uh, a number of effects have already been observed, like block oscillations and Anderson localization, although these are not really interacting effects, but they're effects from, that were originally predicted for solid uh, systems. Uh, the Mott insulator transition uh, has been observed, and it's, a, it's a still an active area of study. Uh, I didn't talk anything about uh, fermions, but you can also observe uh, using, uh, by tuning the interactions in the system, you can observe this crossover between Bose-Einstein condensation and, uh, and BCS type uh, pairing and uh, what's equivalent to superconductivity uh, using fermions, uh, works underway to observe other types of highly correlated uh, uh, systems. Um, for example, the quantum Hall effect, where you want to look at a correlation of a 2D uh, gas, and so on. So there's a number of possibilities and, and lots of different uh, examples and papers in the literature. Um, well, it's running kind of late, so I just I want to end by what I consider a really uh, cool experiment that came out recently from Marcus Reiner's group. So Marcus Reiner was one of the, if you 
notice, but he was one of the authors. He was actually the graduate student on this project in the uh, contentious group. And he now has his own group at Harvard, and he's setting up experiments to look at the mod insulator transition. And he's, uh, but he sets up, he's setting up a 2D Bose gas. But instead of using diffraction to look at the thing, he's interested in actually looking at the pattern of atoms in this mod insulator transition. So he's, he's actually set up a BC experiment where he can actually image the atoms in this optical lattice. And so what he does, he has a basically high numerical aperture light collection system. And so he can actually zoom in and, and see the atoms in this optical lattice. And so here's some images taken from his, his paper where he atoms between adjacent wells are only separated by 640 nanometers. It's quite impressive. What's even more impressive is that he can actually uh, uh, look at this and even follow the dynamics by taking videos. So these are atoms in the optical lattice hopping from site to site. You can see a few of these atoms hopping from well to well. So you can actually follow this in time. And you can get into the mod insulator regime and see various structures as he crosses over into a mod insulator. So in some sense, this is sort of state-of-the-art um, I think the field's really rapidly opening up and it's going to go a long way. Um, so maybe I'll just stop here. It's getting kind of late. Thank you for your attention. observe this, but in principle you could study something about the temperature. Uh, but he has uh, these two papers. Well, the first paper just describes being able to see the atoms, and the second paper, he actually looks at the mod insulator transition. So as you go from this, this state of uh, atoms hopping around to where they get localized. And because the trap um, is, has some shape to it, it's parabolic, what you find is that as you cool down as you cross over this mod insulator, you start seeing rings. Initially, you get the atoms uh, undergoing the mod insulator phase on the edges, where you get one per site. And then, as you get in where the density is higher, then you see two per site and three per site. You can see that basically directly as opposed to inferring it from the fraction. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so that, that's probably the, the biggest issue, um, is that if you scatter too much light, you probably heat it out of there. So it, it's really an only a way. Here you can actually see the hopping dynamics, but I don't think you could actually monitor the whole phase transition, you know, sit there and watch it cross over the phase transition. Okay, okay any more questions? Well, if not, let's thank Chris again.